My name is Dwayne Rogas. I work with Lethbridge County. I'm the Rural Extension Specialist for the county. I'm also the Soil Erosion Officer plus the Pest Control Officer. That's why I'm here today, just to extend some information on gophers. We're just going to cover some of the some basic information on the gopher, and then we're going to show some of the control methods that we have here, right? So, um, essentially, the ground squirrel is known as the prairie gopher, yellow gopher, flicker tail, or picket pin. It's named after the, uh, a naturalist by the name of John Richardson in the, in the early 1820s. Um, as we all know, ground squirrels are a major source of food for predatory birds, mammals, and reptiles. So, like rattlesnakes, bull snakes, and uh, badgers, and eagles, hawks, that type of thing. Um, ground squirrels spend most of their life underground. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, you know, we're just learning that, or I'm just learning that myself. They sleep underground from before sunset till after sunrise and hibernate for eight months. So they're underground for eight months, you know, they kind of stagger that. Um, adult females own one burrow system with five to seven ex exits and two to five sleeping chambers. One chamber is used for rearing their young. Um, mating is in the spring after females emerge from hibernation. The females are fertile for two to three hours on one afternoon on one day each year and may mate with several males. There is one litter of six to eight young born after a 23 day gestation. Their first emergence above ground is at four weeks when the juveniles start to eat solid food and they start to leave their mother or they're not relying on their mother then, okay. Um, <coughs> Natural mortality of ground squirrels is high, particularly males. Females live four years and sometimes to six years. Uh, the males live only one to two years to a maximum of four years. Their major cause of death, or male and female of course, major cause of death is predation and starvation. Basically only half the females and one fifth of the males reach adulthood. <clears throat> to survive without food or water for 210 days when they're hibernating, uh, ground squirrels must consume vast amounts of food, high in energy to develop a reservoir of body fat. Um, the adult male hibernates from mid-June to mid-February, and the adult female hibernates early July to early March. Juvenile females uh, hibernate early August to March. Juvenile males hibernate mid-October to February. So that kind of, you know, just brings light to that. Each ground squirrel hibernates alone in a hibernaculum chamber prepared four to six weeks earlier. Males emerge mid-February, females come out about two weeks later. Females live in or near their birth site, but males disperse further after weaning. The females will recognize their kin throughout their life, and that's even after they hibernate, they always, they'll still recognize their kin. Um, the females rear the litter by, her, by themselves, and the males, they take off. It's just uh, one of those things, I guess. I call him a deadbeat dad, right? <clears throat> um, so the idea with dealing with the with uh, ground squirrels or any pest for that matter is to use an integrated pest management approach, right? One approach isn't gonna, one control is not gonna work, you know, the, the best, it's gonna be an integrated approach, lots of control methods, right? So um, IPM programs, so IPM programs combine management approaches for greater effectiveness. The most effective long-term way to manage pests is by using a combination of methods like I mentioned, right? And then six of the, um, oh well, IPM principles and practices are combined to create IPM programs. While each situation is different, six major components are common to all IPM programs. So identificate, pest identification is one. Number two is monitoring and assessing pest numbers and damage. Number three, guidelines for when management action is needed. Four is preventing pest problems. Five, using a combination of biological, cultural, physical and mechanical, and then commit chemical management tools. And six is after action is taken, assess the effect of pest management. So six is essentially assessing the management techniques, right? Um, <coughs> basically, one of the fundamentals for long-term damage control is the assessment. What is the damage and what are the actual direct costs? This assessment includes downtime and time lost to repair equipment crop production and yield loss, soil rehabilitation and weed control. A major building block for both assessing damage and developing long-term management plans is estimating rodent numbers. This estimate also helps determine if, when, where and what type of management tool to employ when numbers reach certain levels. Um, when populations expand, oh no, there are several ways to estimate ground squirrel numbers. A popular monitoring technique is, a, is the combination of electronically recorded stress calls and visual counts where ground squirrels respond physically, vocally, or both. One aspect of this technique is to visually count the number of squirrels in a 100 meter by 100 meter area. 
um, that respond to a handheld imitation ground squirrel call. I don't know if you have that with you, Evan, but yeah, yeah just if you just give it a little blast on that. And how do you work? How does that work? You just suck into it. Uh, you're supposed to blow once every about 30 seconds. Uh, works really great on windy days like today. And then generally it'll just, uh, it's like a, a danger call essentially where if they're in the burrow, they'll stick their head up or if they're out, you often you'll see them standing on their uh, back legs and they're just easy to identify. Okay. Yeah. And so basically in that 100 by 100 meter area, within that area, five Richardson ground squirrels counted prior to young, young, emerging, young emerging, or 20 ground squirrels counted after emergence of young are considered heavy populations. So that's going to be your, your thresholds, right? Another good technique for estimating ground squirrel numbers is to count the active mounds within one meter as you walk, 100 meters. One active mound per two strides over 100 meters is considered a heavy population. Um, the best method for estimating Richardson ground squirrel densities is to live trap squirrels in a set area for one day and compare that number to previous captured numbers for the same area. This difference will indicate an increase or decrease in population numbers. So comparison of captured numbers needs to be done at the same time of the Richardson ground squirrel cycle under similar weather conditions. Um, we'll talk about thresholds here. <coughs> the action threshold is the population size of a colony of ground squirrels that will require remedial action to prevent any increase that could result in unacceptable economic loss. The economic threshold is the population size of a colony that will require immediate management because the size is known to, to exceed the point where, where it will cause unacceptable economic loss to the landowner. One active mound per four strides or 20% crop damage over 100 meters is a concern for possible control measures. So essentially we've got, you know, what do we got? One hole here and two. So if I go four strides, one, two, three, four, I've basically got four holes there. So we can consider that an infestation and go from there. If I'm doing, if I'm my, on my third stride here and I go four here and include this one, one hole in four strides, you know, it just depends if you like that gopher or not, you know, you, you can get rid of them or not, but that's not an econ it's not an econ economic threshold there, right? <coughs> um, essentially, that's what it is. This bait station here, with the bait station, the county, are you from the county of Lethbridge? Yeah, I live okay, in Okay, so if you wanted to use a bait station, the guys can bring it, you phone the Ag Service Board, they'll bring that out to you. We have MSDS sheets on there already so that, you know, the people can uh, treat themselves if there's ever an issue there. Um, this, the, what we're using here is from Poolins, it's Gopher Doom, and also UFA sells this, as well as this Rosal there too, right? So they both, they sell both of those. Um, the county does not. And essentially, the idea with this, if you have it out in the field, you have to have a little bit more signage on here. You want to have danger, poison on here, and stuff like that, so that, you know, somebody doesn't come along and, and play with it or something. And then the idea here is to make sure that you're not getting off-target kills, right? You put the pest or the, uh, the, the cereal grain in there with the chemical, with the poison, and that way you're not going to have, well, let's say a cow or a horse eating the grains or something like that, right? So that's, that's the idea there, avoiding off-target kills. Um, we could go on about that kind of thing, and, you know, we could talk about how much you put down there, but basically it's all written down on the instructions, so I'm, not, I'm just going to skip by that and then just mention that uh, I think... You know, once you've got your thresholds established, so if you have an economic threshold, you want to deal with it, <coughs> it now's the time to uh, consider the various control methods available. So cultural, I, I, we, talked, we touched briefly on that. So disking and plowing an area, that'll keep them away a bit because they don't want to keep digging their holes. Um, tall vegetation we mentioned too, that, you know, they're scared to be, if they can't see, they're scared, right, you know. Uh, biological, so that's using mammalian, avian, reptilian predators. We mentioned this. Chemical is toxicants and anticoagulants. And mechanical is shooting or trapping. Now, with the shooting, there are setback distances, right? Now, do you know what the setback distance from the road would be? It's 150 meters. So, a lot of our gophers are within that, right? You know, along the roadside. And then, a setback distance to a dwelling is 100 meters. So, um, if you have permission from the landowner or the dwelling owner, he might have you shooting out of his window. I don't know, but that's that's fine. But uh, you have to have that permission. In other words, it's 100 meters away from that. Okay. Um, you know, I guess I think I covered that. Basically, that's about it. I think we could just go and show this and then go from there, right? 
this we'll I'll show the cheetah thing after if you want if you, if you're interested in that and uh, we'll we'll just demonstrate this here. So this is Evan Greenoff and Dylan Greenoff. They they own Rocan or well, they operate Rocan Industries and this is just a great alternative to shooting and, and all the other things, right? It's it's safe and uh, like they mentioned, they've done a lot of horse pastures this year and you know, there's no adverse effects or anything like that to the horses, so. <coughs> yeah, basically uh, our product is a uh, um, poison-free foam that you pump down the, either the gopher burrow or the rat burrow. It expands, pushes out the air and forces the rodent in the burrow to suck it in. <laughs> Ice cream trucks here, hey? <laughs> wow, better grab one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Take chocolate. Morton, focus. <laughs> no, this will not. And you'll and you'll hear in their presentation it's really not that poisonous. It's actually got mustard. Mustard. No, no, thank you. I'm okay, thank you. But yeah, it's actually from what I've read and, and what these guys' this presentation has said, it's, you know, this is a great alternative for goodness sakes. Uh, and, and it kills them right away. That's, that's the best thing as far as I'm concerned. And then you don't have the pesticide or the poison in the, in the animal for them to be ate later on by off target or, or to die or, you know, badger or something, then it's an off target kill, right? So yeah, yeah it's, it's really good. Sorry, Evan, go ahead. No worries. Please. So yeah, again, uh, just kind of quick synopsis, poison free foam, you pump it down the go for rat burrow. It expands, pushes out the air, forces the rodent to suck in that foam. It fills their lungs. They're unconscious within a minute and dead within three. So uh, this product is used a lot in urban environments. Again, schools, cemeteries, golf courses, do lots of work with that where they don't have the option to shoot. Uh, they don't have the option to poison because they're um, worried about children or animals or you know secondary poisoning even as well. Um, so do a lot of that. We also do um, lots of pastures. Uh, this year, especially we did lots of horse acreages where again, they're worried uh, about uh, the secondary poisoning and uh, that's kind of the gist of the product and how it works. I'll quickly just give you a little bit of detail about the equipment and then I'll show you how it works. In order to use our product uh, you need an application tank and they generally range anywhere from 200 to 400 liters. Uh, you got a uh, uh, demand pump. We recommend anything above three gallons per minute. Right here I got five gallon per minute. Uh, then you got uh, you know our kind of our special aeration nozzles and then uh, some cones. Uh, so when you mix the product, uh, the product comes in these four liter jugs of concentrate and for every one jug you add a hundred liters of water and that's your field solution and that stays as a liquid until it's pumped through the, the nozzle here. So if you uh, actually haven't done these ones over here, so it stays as a liquid Oh, there's the gopher whistle. Uh, until this point where the air is injected into uh, the mixture and then it uh, rapidly expands. I'll just shoot it on the ground here so you can get a... Shut off one of the valves so it didn't leak. There you go. So you get a uh, kind of idea here. You can see it's... Uh, there, now it's foaming. You can see it's a very wet a base foam and uh, that makes it ideal because as Dwayne touched on earlier, a lot of these burrow systems have multiple entrances, they have multiple chambers, and so that 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 water-based foam is able to just kind of seep into all, any kind of crevice within the burrow system and fill that completely up. Um, so that's nice about that. If the burrows, if these, again, these are artificial holes, but if these two were connected and I were apply down this hole, you'd see the foam coming out the other one. So when we uh, when we're doing application, uh, you put a cone in here and uh, put, place it in firmly and then you just apply the, the product through the cone and uh, oh we're kinked now the uh, the cone just acts as a physical barrier so if they do try and escape often you'll hear them scratching at the bottom you'll see the foam surging and that's them just trying to uh, you know get out of the foam so you see this foams up it'll run over top and then depending too on the, the, the shape and size of the burrow, like if it's horizontal or it's again connected, you'll see that foam sometimes kind of seep back into the, into the cone. And uh, you know, as long as it's topped off, you know you got enough, uh, you know, enough foam down there. That's again, one of the nice things about the product. 
uh, when people ask us a lot about uh, poisoning and dosage rates and you know times of the year and the nice thing is this this product isn't dependent at all on feeding habits or dosage it's one of those things where as long as there's foam in there and there's not air an air pocket you know you've got control so that's the only way that this product doesn't work it's a misapplication where you don't have enough foam so you can generally tell when you pull the cone you can see the foam levels flush there's no kind of pocket beneath it's the cone is completely seated in it so that's how you know and the event where you don't apply enough foam the nice thing about this product is that gopher will will be sitting right above the foam level where he's breathing air and he'll just kind of be lethargic because he sucks some in but he'll be alive because again the method of control is uh suffocation from being you know submersed in that foam so uh when we do urban applications and stuff primarily uh, you know, we use these cones again, they're really nice, they make it easy, we can just treat and keep moving. Uh, when you're doing urban and it gets a little bit bigger, you know, we do have individuals applied that don't use the cones because that kind of takes out the labor if I'm having to move cones all the time. You know, that can be a little bit labor intensive on a bigger scale. So what they'll do, they'll use this product just to flush the gopher out of the burrow and then they'll dispatch, of, uh, dispatch it above ground however they choose. So there's that. Uh, another thing to mention is kind of Dwayne touched on with the integrated pest management. We have lots of people that use our product in conjunction with other control methods. You have individuals that bait at the beginning of the year and then as soon as that grass comes out and they no longer want the grains, they'll come in with this product and kind of mop up. We've also, you know, other people will go in and knock down the population with this first and then just put a couple bait stations out and then have the population control itself after. So this works really well. It's in, uh, in conjunction with other methods of control. It's a, you know, it's a different, it's another tool in your toolbox kind of deal. So. And Evan, can you just touch on the active ingredients there too? Yeah, for sure. So there's two uh, active ingredients in this product. Uh, the one is this patented foam. It's just a foaming agent that again is doing what you see there. And the other main ingredient is food grade mustard powder. Literally the stuff you make mustard that you put on your hot dogs with. Um, and that's just in there so that that gets suspended in the foam. Actually, if you are interested, you can kind of see here, there's some of this particulate left. And uh, what that does is that's suspended in the foam and that when it sucks in, it goes into their lungs and just plugs up their alveoli where that oxygen exchange happens. And it's just an added layer of protection to make sure that when they get knocked out, that they stay uh, knocked out and ultimately die. So, uh, you know, we treated this, we treated this whole, um, you know, 10, 10 minutes half an hour ago and you can already see it's it's it disappears so within 12 hours you'll have no sign of the product being used so you know we can go into schoolyards and stuff and do an overnight job and the very next day the kids can be on the playground and there's no worry i think you mentioned before that there was a dog that got his nose in there and he come out and he was no adverse effects or nothing like nothing that, at so. all yeah we uh it's one of those things, again, the method of control is being submersed in the foam to the point where it fills your lungs and it's held, you're held in that, that state for a period of time. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, with a, in that instance with the guy's dog, it was just a short period of time. Yeah, it got in his lungs, he choked a bit, but he's completely fine. Yeah. So, it's just a matter of choke. Um, open. So, the idea is to let it run for 10 seconds to warm up here. Actually, I'm sorry, that's 30 seconds to warm up, and then you put it in the hole for 10 seconds, and that's all you have to have in there. Okay. If you start revving it up high idle, within before that 30 seconds, your blow bearings on it, I guess. So it's really fitting. $1,200 out of the US, I guess. Well, that's all well enough. jury's out we don't know how effective it is yet they just purchased this equipment just a little while ago right so yeah. I'm sure by this time next year we'll know the efficacy of it and go from there right so yeah.